Welcome to our pre-show and thanks to all of our replay viewers. This is the show before the show, so stand by for our official show, which starts at 3 p.m. in about two minutes. Our guests are going to be Jim Price, Government Employees Director, and Jason Chan of Apala. He's going to tell us all about Apala because it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, so we're going to get ready for that. So Jason is standing by out on the West Coast. Jim Price is right next to me right here. And I'm going to let Jim tell you in the next minute, you have barely two minutes, okay, <laughs> to tell us a little bit about you, where you started out when you first joined the IAM, so I can start my stream over here. So, go. Well, I can tell you real quickly, I started out uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, June 6th, I'll be a 40-year member of the IAM. Uh, started June, the, my, well, I finished my probation June 6th of uh, 1978, and I worked my way up. To, uh, from a learner helper to a, a mechanic, electrical, and radio. And uh, then I became a HPW coordinator for the company, I mean, sorry, for the union as a liaison between the company and the union. Uh, after that, uh, I was a business agent for two years in St. Louis at District Lodge 837. Way to go, guys. And uh, after that, I came to headquarters in 1998. Oh, that's great. I just want to welcome a couple people who joined us. Ramon Garcia says, howdy, from Southern Territory. Hey, Ramon. We have Eric Alvarez from Downers Grove, Illinois. Hey, nice to see you, Eric. Thanks for joining us for the pre-show. Giles Shepard, Kylie Hernandez, thank you so much. This is our show before the show. So 40 years, that's a long time. I don't think I've stayed in a job more than nine and a half. Well, well it's not necessarily the a job, job right, itself. Right. So yeah. you've been a, a machinist union member for 40 years. For 40 years. As of June 6th. That's impressive. I didn't think I could ever finish anything like this. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, though. Yeah, it is. I, I'm wonderful. proud of that. Proud so, of that. So I think we have, pro oh, it's 3 o'clock. Oh, well, it's time to go. We're going to get started. Let's get started. Activate your voice. Fight for your right. Speak up. Speak out. We're, we're union and we're proud. proud. Go Union! Live from Maryland, this is Activate Live! Welcome to Activate Live. I'm Tanya Hutchins coming to you live from Machinist Union headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, just outside the Beltway around Washington, D.C. Today we're going to talk about organizing and collective bargaining as they relate to fighting for protections for federal workers. And we'll introduce you to another constituency group of the AFL-CIO, Apala. But first, we have some things to tell you about, just get you up to date on what's happening in our union. Um, for our news items, Delane Adams is on location. He is on assignment, so he's not here this uh, week. But first, IAM has secured voluntary certification at Toronto's Pearson International Airport. In case you've missed that news, we'll catch you up. It's a new collective bargaining agreement there and new members. The new three-year agreement provides a wage increases of 3% each year, a boot allowance of $120, and the employer has agreed to pay for 24 hours a month for union activists to attend monthly membership meetings. Also, we have nearly 300 IAM members who voted overwhelmingly to ratify a new contract at local 1842 in Pennsylvania. The five-year agreement there includes wage increases, pension increases, and continued health care coverage with cost containment measures that also increases life and accidental death insurance and sickness and accident benefits. Last week we told you about Rick Pence, a machinist union member and worker at Harley-Davidson plant that is scheduled to close in Kansas City, Missouri. And he did a great job honestly describing how the closure will affect him, his coworkers, and the community. So kudos to Rick Pence of IAM Local 176 in our Midwest territory. And dozens of members of various unions joined employees of Technocap for a solidarity rally yesterday in Glendale, West Virginia where IAM Local 818 is on strike. So we want to give a shout out to our members and all the members of the area unions that showed up in solidarity at Technocap in Glendale, West Virginia. These are some of the photos from the rally yesterday. Our General Vice President, Jimmy Canigliero, was also there showing his support. You see a picture of him right there. So hang in there, everybody. We're with you. Well, the president signed four executive orders Friday, 
And for public unions, they were actually three, but I counted four on the website, so we'll talk about that. But they, it, the ones that were affecting the public unions, we consider that an attack on civil servants. Now, the orders limit official time spent on union work to no more than a quarter of the workday. They require federal agencies to negotiate union contracts in less than a year. And they direct managers to more quickly fire employees with poor performance or misconduct. But it's not that simple. And as far as our government employees department is concerned, this is just another way to undermine unions, which represent many of the government's two million employees. Well, Director Jim Price joins us now to break this all down for us. Jim, I know, thank you so much for being here. I know this isn't simple. We printed out some of the executive orders, um, and a few of them are like executive order ensuring transparency, accountability, and efficiency in taxpayer-funded union time use. We have the executive order developing efficient, effective, and cost-reducing approaches to federal sector collective bargaining. Right. There was also one promoting accountability and streamlining removal procedures consistent right. with merit system principles. The titles sound like these are good things. But when you go in and you read what's actually in there, what's really going on? Well, first thing I want to give a big shout out to our folks at uh, Nifty Federal District 1 uh, fighting the fight with us. Also, uh, uh, some friends that I have over at AFGE. Uh, we've probably had a lot of conversations uh, this week, a couple of my friends there. Uh, we're working on a few things. I'd like to try to go through some of the things that you just mentioned. Uh, because there's going to be some more conversation with a, a couple of groups here tomorrow to try to figure out a path forward. First off, in regards to uh, uh, negotiating better contracts, the whole process of negotiations in the federal sector, from my limited experience, even though I've been sitting here for 22 years and kind of in and out of the federal sector, uh, they're basically saying that, you know, they take too long to get done. Well, the problem is it's more of an agency problem than it is a union problem. Uh, most cases, uh, negotiations can get done probably within maybe a, a week, two weeks. Agencies don't set up the time to meet with our, our negotiators. They may have two week, two days here, three days there. They go through uh, uh, how do you do, how do you what do you call it? They go through uh, ground rules, mm -hmm. uh, and then the other part of that is, is that you know. After you're all done negotiating, after you've been waiting for maybe three, four weeks to sit down and negotiate and you got your agreement, they have to send the particular agreement off to the agency head for approval. That takes 30 days. So it's not the federal unions or the federal employees' fault that basically it takes so long to, to negotiate these agreements. It's the agency that holds up the process in a lot of cases. So, and so it's basically the government's process that is in place now. Absolutely. So this isn't necessarily going to change that process for them. We're not sure yet. These, okay. these are the things that we're not sure yet because uh, a lot of the EO, EO, all three of them are very vague. We don't know how they're going to be applied. And you won't know that until OPM, Office of Personnel Management, has issued the orders. And that hasn't happened yet. So right now, everything is kind of in limbo. Nobody really knows or understands what's going on. However, you can go ahead and you can surmise what they, what you believe that they're going to do. Uh, in regards to the reduction of official time down to 25%, uh, I just think that that's just ridiculous. And I, I think that that's, they know it's ridiculous. I can mean, you get your union work done in, the, in a quarter of the workday? No. Uh, it, can you just give people an idea? If there are any non-union members watching, just what it is in the day of, in the life of, you know, a federal steward. Yeah, I I can't give you what it's like to be a federal steward. I've never been one. However, however, I can tell you that first off, union federal union stewards do not go out and hold union meetings. Mm -hmm. That's what we're being accused of. Federal union members or stewards don't go out and don't lobby on on uh, official time. It's illegal. It's against the Hatch Act. They know this. But like you said, these, these, these titles, they, they sound so good, you know. But the bottom line is they're filled with, uh, I don't want to use the word, but they're filled with lies. Uh, and we don't want people to be misled. No, we want to be transparent. No, we want to make sure that basically everybody understands that, you know, uh, this is a process that has been, number one, it's been going on for over 50 years. This, the representation process of federal employees and how they survive. 
uh, and we want people to know that we're doing the best we can to make sure that the service is provided to the taxpayer. By the way, all the federal employees that work in the workplace out there, uh, at whatever location they work at or what agency, they're taxpayers too. That's right. Okay. These are our neighbors. These are neighbors, yeah. Yes. They're taxpayers too. But if you have a federal steward that goes out and does say, uh, has a problem, a sexual harassment violation, that could take some time. You have to investigate that. You got to make sure that you uh, talk with the right people. You got to talk with the agency uh, uh, manager. Uh, it, it's a real problem. So it could take up that 25% that you're going that you've got for whatever it is—a day, a week, a month. We don't know yet. A year. We have no idea what that's all about yet. Right. Can you put this in some historical perspective for us? Because some of these rules that we had previously, before these executive orders came out, go back 50 years, don't they? It goes back to John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, and Executive Order 10988. Uh, you had President Carter, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm thinking 71, 72. It was in 61 70s. in the 70s, I'll say that, yeah, because okay. I'm not really sure of the year, uh, because that's uh, when the civil service reform was done. And then even President Nixon. Mm -hmm. That's right. In 72, actually did some civil service reform. So these are things that are not necessarily uh, 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 not based in some type of logic. Uh, Title V uh, has systems and principles by which federal employees work. And it also involves industrial due process. So when these EOs came out, they basically damaged that system. Now, not quite yet, mm -hmm. but whenever you know the OPM folks decide to put the uh, um, put the orders out on it. I just want to let you know that we have Randy Irwin's watching mm -hmm. from National Federation of Federal Employees. He said, "Thanks for doing this discussion." Um, Will, William Attig is reminding us that one in four post 9/11 vets work in government. Absolutely, and that's that's another thing. 30% of the workforce in the federal government are veterans. So why would you, you say that you, 45 says, and I don't want to get excited today because it's just not worth the time to lose my temper the way that I do, and if people know me, uh, I can get pretty vocal. But 45 decides that, you know, he loves veterans. He doesn't want to do anything to harm them. However, this is harming veterans. This is harming veterans because 30% of them work for the federal government, whether it be in, in uh, forest service, whether it be uh, whether it be making passports, whether it be at, at Red River Army Depot, whether it be or at Bremer, Bremer, Bremerton Shipyard, yep. government printing office, these are veterans that are going, by these EOs, they're, they're being damaged. They're being damaged. And, and, and I want to tell you something, this merit systems uh, EO, the one that talks about the merit systems. Mm -hmm. This one is just really kind of blows my mind. When you stop and you think about uh, people not being fired for over, what does he say, six oh, months to a year. That's right, because right now you have 60 days to 120 days, right? And he wants to put it down to 30 days? Yeah. Okay. But now here's the deal. This is another situation where the agencies themselves are at fault. If there's an adverse action, Let's say uh, you, you've, uh, you were caught doing drugs on the job. And believe me, we have the situation where 10% of the people cause 90% of the problems. Not every government employee is out there uh, hired in the Georgia Pine. They're, they're hardworking people. That's right. So, but you still have problems. Let's just say one of them has that. That suspension should be 14 days or more. Now, in most cases, what they'll do, they'll put these folks out six to eight months and they'll pay them. That's the government made that decision. Okay? Now, I'm stepping into a little bit of a gray area here because, I mean, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, you know, you're going to put somebody out for six to eight months, and then you're going to blame the unions. You're going to blame us for the time period it takes. That's just not right. Uh, then you fool around and you have to basically make a decision, and after that, you know, then we have to, we have to act. We react to that. We don't act on this stuff. We react to it. So you've got a lot of problems here that, that basically are created by the government itself. I want to also make sure that everybody understands that I was reading an article by Joe Davidson this morning. Joe Davidson says or has gotten some uh, information from the uh, uh, Government Managers Association. It's a, an association that the managers for federal sector belong to. They're not so sure of what they're going to do with this. This is a real issue. It's a real problem. So 
that being said, <laughs> where are we at? Well, you mentioned earlier how, you know, it makes a lot of people angry. It makes you angry, mm -hmm. especially on social media where people are watching. Yeah. You know, we get emotional on social media, mm -hmm. but I think it's really important for us to turn our anger into action. Right. You know, so how can we do that? What is the best way for us to, to turn that anger into action? The best way for us to turn that anger into action is to, is to organize. It's to organize, and it's basically to fight back. We got to quit sitting back as federal employees. We have to fight back. We got to call our congressmen. We got to call our senators. We have to talk to our our neighbors. We, we the unions have to get together. They got to come together to to basically work with each other to try to make that happen. And this is happening. And we can call the White House too. This you is can the call White House switchboard. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Two zero two four five six one 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 one. That's two zero two four five six eleven eleven is the White House switchboard, and we need to tell them that this is unfair to govern employees who are our neighbors. Yep. Um, these are workers who are doing the day-to-day -day work of the government. That's exactly. Um, running the government decade after decade. Well, for as long as basically there's been a government. That's right. This, the administrations may change, but the people that do the day-to-day -day work. The grunts. Yes, they are the ones that are there, and yeah. I think a lot of people forget that. But I want to make sure that we tell everybody that's watching, because I know, like you said, you've tagged a couple of the other organizations. Tomorrow, uh, and, and our members, I want them to know this, tomorrow we are going to be sitting down with uh, the other federal unions. and I One can, of which is AFGE, AFGE American and Federation NIFI, of Government Employees. NIFI, and NIFI, and, and there will probably be... Uh, uh, some other federal unions that will be there. Lyonet has some federal employees. All of the, the major unions have some federal employees. But we're going to be sitting down tomorrow having a conversation about next steps. Uh, we want to try to make sure that we do the right thing so that we don't harm ourselves in this process and harm our membership. But I want to tell you we need to organize. We've got to organize. We've got to talk to our, our congressmen and senators. This is totally ridiculous what's being dropped by 45 and I won't use his name, uh, I, I just don't understand why someone would do something like this, especially somebody who doesn't understand the system itself. It's, it's ridiculous. And we have to pay attention to these. I mean, I know it may not be easy, Absolutely. but you can go to whitehouse.gov. Yeah. I mean, that's where we printed them out. Absolutely. Um, and you could search executive orders and, and, and you, search it you can by come date. up with those, exactly. Right, and you'll look for these particular ones were, I think, May 25th, which was last fr Friday, just a few days ago. Under the budget and spending section, you'll be able to find them. Right, and then you can actually read each executive order, um, the three that we've been talking about so far. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the three executive orders that were signed last Friday that were affecting public unions and we're very concerned about it and we want to make sure that all of our members make their voices heard that all union members make their voices heard um and even if you're not in a union and you are a federal worker you are a federal worker um you should go read these as well because it affects your job and you should join the union and i want to say one more last thing and i guess basically that would that would kind of make everything come together this is not just about federal unions here I think all of the people that I deal with on a, on a regular basis, all the representatives I deal with understand this is about labor as a whole. The federal unions are in trouble now, but I tell you right now, they're picking at us with right to work in Missouri, but by God, I tell you what, they will in fact come after all of labor. This is just a precursor. You got the Janus decision that may drop, and then there's a pension issue that's out there that's lingering around, too, for federal employees, which is really, really draconian as well. So. Yeah, I think it's unfair, to, t especially to touch current pensions for that's people who have already retired. That's coming. And they are... They're after it. Yeah, that's, that's their livelihood. They've been counting on that money, yeah. and they are counting on that money, and to have it taken away I yeah. think is unfair. One more thing. In one of these executive orders, it talks about charging union members rent <laughs> for using space in federal buildings. Yeah, that's, that's a... I don't know. I just don't know. I, he, he, Can you imagine traveling back and forth to a location, trying to take care of your union members that may have grievances? Or yeah, and, and you're going to have to pay for the pay for the, uh, the the area you use. However, let's just say you have a sexual harassment case, and I use that because that's probably very severe. 
where are you going to go and take a person that has that feels like they've been sexually harassed and talk to them, you know, in private so that they don't feel like, you know, they're they're talking to the world. This is this is just like any other steward uh, situation. You want some place where people will open up and talk to you about their their issue and give you the right story. If you don't have that office to work with, I mean, I tell you what, you might as well forget it. Nobody's going to want to talk to you in the midst of uh, all their coworkers. That's yeah, or in the bathroom the, or you know, yeah, break it's room. just the break room. It's just yeah. not, it's not feasible. Well, we appreciate you coming and taking the time to talk to us, and please keep us up to date on on what other um, things that we can do. Yeah. Um, and. Jim, you're welcome to make comments as well. I'm sure um, when people have the replay, <laughs> they'll probably have some questions. So yeah. um, we're hoping that people talk to each other. Um, Sandra Engel tells us the writing is on the wall. Going after the public sector unions is the first step, but not the last. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. And Kenny Mitchell is saying, you know, these companies that come in and work for the government, for the government wants them to cut all their workers' insurance and benefits. So when it comes to crunch time, you know, they're all okay, yeah. but. You know, there's always something. So we're glad that we... That's the subcontracting part yeah, of it. Yeah. Now, you know, don't be fooled. If they can subcontract some of this work and put it into the private sector, they'll do it. They'll do it. Uh, when I first started this, there was a thing called inherently governmental. I tell you what, I've watched them try to subcontract the, the government printing, printing office, and they're still trying to subcontract it. Uh, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, I mean, these are things that are inherently governmental and should never be done by a private sector firm. It's something that should be regulated by the government, but we have people that want to want to just put it out there. And I truly believe that you can be efficient and transparent and fair at the same time. Absolutely. Our government has done it for over, over 200 years so far. What's stopping us from doing it now? That's right. Thanks again, Jim Price. Appreciate it. Director appreciate of our it. government employees. And we'll let you know what happens tomorrow. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you to all of the NEFI IM members watching, as, as well as AFGE. Um, and thank you for working together with us on this. Absolutely. So let us know what happens. We will do that. Thank you so much. And you too can join the conversation. So let us know what you think in the comments section on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube in the live chat. Um, so you can even do that during the replay as well. Um, so we have people joining already. Dave Lehigh has joined us. Um, we have uh, General Vice President Jim Finoglieri. Thank you, Jim, for joining us. Um, so thank you. Keep the conversation going. Um, we really do appreciate everybody who um, has joined us for this conversation. We'll keep it going, and we hope that you take action by calling uh, the White House number that we gave to you earlier, the 202-456-1111. That's 202-456-1111. And let the White House know what you think. You can also um, let your congressman or woman uh, know what you think uh, by calling the Senate or the House. I am just requeuing my prompter because it got askew. <laughs> so I'm getting that uh, lined up right now uh, so that everything will be ready for you. So just stand by and I'm going to get ready for our next interview. So I wanted to let you know that May is Pacific American Heritage Month and we thought that it would be a great idea for you to be introduced to APALA. And APALA is the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, AFL-CIO. This is their website, apollonet.org. Um, and the month celebrates the achievements and the contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States. Um, joining us now from our Western territory is the president of Local 751A, Jason Chan. Thanks for taking the time, Jason. Thank you, Diane. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm very excited. Um, Brother Price, that's a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best to, uh, <laughs> to continue the tradition here, brother. You'll be fine. First off, tell us a little bit about what job you were doing when you first joined the IAM. Well, I hired into Boeing as a wing line mechanic in 2008. So that was, um, that's when I initiated was January of 2008 um, and worked on the wing line for roughly seven years. Um, and actually recently was just uh, appointed a staff here at the district as an organizer. Excellent. 
Now, what other roles do you have? Because I know you're also on the board of Apollo. Is that correct? I am. I am on the national executive board. I was appointed by international president Martinez to succeed uh, retired GVP Diane Babineau last year. So I sworn for my two year to last convention uh, in Orange County last year. So what does it mean to you to be a member of Apollo? We have some photos of you in action at some of the Apollo events. Um, what does it mean to you to, to, to be a part of Apollo? Jason, are you still there? Okay, these are photos of Jason at various Apollo events. I think we may have lost his audio. Can you hear me, Jason? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yep, now I can hear you. Okay, so my introduction to Apollo was by one of our longtime members, uh, Chris Louie uh, and Tong Trang, a couple guys um, who just wanted me to be aware of the fact that we had a constituency group for Asian Americans. Um, before that, I, I really didn't have any um, participation with that. And it was them that brought me to the table and said, okay, we're trying to identify someone who could be a leader going forward in the movement. And that's how I got involved. And they started bringing me to chapter meetings and um, it just kind of grew from there. What is Apollo's mission? What do you tell people um, that you're trying to recruit? Well, we, we try to tell people that we're the first and only national organization of Asian American Pacific Islanders. And we're, the majority of us are union members. And like the other constituency groups, we're trying to advance worker, immigrant, and civil rights. Um, Asian American and Pacific Islanders have a rich history in the labor movement from um, California farm workers to Alaska cannery workers and uh, pineapple and sugar plantation workers. Um, we have a rich history. We deserve a, a seat at the table. You know, we have concerns and issues that are somewhat unique to ourselves, but also they are just like any of the other constituency groups. And most um, workers were just trying to advance human and civil rights, and, and we want our voice to be heard. Now tell me a little bit about who your inspiration was, because you were talking about the rich history of Apollo, but you have a rich history as well. Well, uh, my, my personal inspiration is my mother. Um, my father passed away when I was one, so I was raised as an only child by a single mother. Um, and it, like most teenage boys growing up, you think you know everything, you don't, <laughs> you don't really want to listen to your parents. And it wasn't until I got up a little bit older and moved out on my own and then subsequently had kids of my own that I really realized how much of a struggle she had. Um, she is my hero. Uh, we have a great relationship today, um, but it, always, it wasn't always like that. But she is probably my biggest inspiration in my life is just seeing what she had to go through being mom and dad and to raise a, a child on your own is, you know, when, when you're, you have a, a spouse or a partner, it's hard enough as it is with two people, but to have someone, um, a single parent that's it's a it's a tremendous achievement so she is my inspiration well I'm sure she's proud because we're proud um, to have you as well with the IAM Jason tell us a little bit about the Young Leaders Council okay Young Leaders Council is similar to our um, Young Machinist group um, it's a good way for us to um, identify and educate our next generation of leaders and um, activists in the labor movement um, but not only to educate and um, to identify those next group of leaders, but it's a good opportunity for us to learn from their perspective as well. Um, sometimes we're a little set in our ways and we need to get the perspective of some of our younger members and activists to, you know, not necessarily, re, you know, reinvent the wheel, but to get a different perspective. Maybe we, we should try a different uh, path, a different option on, on organizing or talking to people, civic engagement. Um, everyone has something to bring to the table and we need to be mindful of that when we're listening to our younger members. Um, so that's basically what our Young Leaders Council is there to do, is to have conversations about issues in their communities and to have their voices heard at the table uh, at our National Executive Board. They have a committee and they report out on, on their activities and their act actions. Jason I, want to let, Jason, I want to let you know that we have some people joining us and making comments. Larry Brown saying, proud of Brother Chan. He is a great leader for our union. Um, Sandra Angle says, Brother Jason is a great leader for National Apollo, proud to know him and serve with him. So you are definitely felt throughout the country uh, by machinist union members um, and workers alike. Appreciate that. 
I'm going to give you an opportunity for an open mic where you can talk to union members, you can talk to workers, you can tell them anything that you want to know either about your work or about Apollo. Okay. Well, there's a couple of things I want to touch. If you have the opportunity, you should join a constituency group, be it Apollo, CLU, CBTU, LACLA. Everyone deserves a voice at the table, as uh, actually Brother Larry Brown would say, um, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So, you know, you need to have your voice heard. You need to have your opinions out there because we are in a mode where the country um, is in a little bit of crisis and the attack on unions and working people in general is just nonstop. So we need to be able to have a voice. We need to be able to, to, to band together in solidarity um, to make change in this country. Um, that being said, I'll leave with uh, my brother, Kevin Cummings, uh, is a GLR from the Western Territories. He's a founder of Council Fire, the Council for First Inhabitants Rights and Equality. We need to find a way for the AFL-CIO to officially recognize them as a constituency group. The people that were here first in this country need to have a voice at the table. They deserve it. It's long overdue. I spoke about it at a convention. I've spoken about it at state conventions. Um, that group of folks really needs to have a voice. We need to find a way to support them so they can have that voice officially, again, be recognized by the AFL-CIO. I totally agree with you, Jason. I'm a member of all of the constitu constituency groups, including Council Fire. Um, so I totally agree with you about that. And I love how the constituency groups work together, including working with Council Fire. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jason Chan, president of IAM Local 751A in our Western Territory and also a member of the National Board of Apollo. So for more information, you can visit the website, apollonet.org. That is apollonet.org if you want more information on um, the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. And there's the website right there. That is what you will see. Well, you too can join the conversation right here on this social media page. Just comment and let us know what you think. Let us know if you're a member of Apollo and what you're doing about diversity, inclusion, and equity in your local or your workplace. So we I'm so thankful that Jason Chan was able, able to join us along with um, Jim Price. So everybody, time to mark your calendars for upcoming classes, meetings, and conferences. Get those pens ready because we have a lot to show you. If you're interested in taking a class in July, registrations are due now. And these are classes that are at the William W. Wimpissinger Education and Technology Center in Hollywood, Maryland. That's our training center for the Machinist Union. The classes that are available to sign up for right now are Leadership 1 and 2, Advanced Leadership, Financial Officers, and Retirees Education and Strategy. Um, as far as our meetings go, this weekend is the Ontario Provincial Council of Machinists in Kingston. June 4th through the 6th is the Pennsylvania State Council of Machinists in York. June 9th is the Maine Machinist Conference in Portland, Maine, and we will be there for a special edition of Activate Live. So I'll be going up there with uh, Joe Heckman. So we're looking forward to that. Other special events, the Western Territory Staff Conference this weekend in Portland. The TCU IAM Convention is coming up in July in Las Vegas, July 24th to the 26th. In August is the IAM Health and Safety Conference in Hollywood, Maryland. That's the week of August 12th. And August 23rd to the 25th is the Pride at Work Convention in Phoenix. Pride at Work is another AFL constituency group. And September 11th to the 14th is the IAM Aerospace Conference, which takes place in Fort Worth, Texas. It is also contest time. There's still time to enter our photo and newsletter contest. The deadline for each is June 15th, so get in your entries. You have a little over two weeks to find your best photos or submit your newsletter or website. Check our website, goiam.org, for entry information. And we are going to tell you about the Labor Media Awards Competition, which is open for submissions. It's sponsored by the International Labor Communications Association, which we affectionately call ILCA. You can enter under several categories. And if you go to the website and you click on categories at the top and just scroll down, it'll show you all of the categories. Um, some of them are visual communications, writing, electronic media, organizing, or best multimedia campaign. Now there are a couple of deadlines to keep in mind. So physical media is actually due July 23rd, and online submissions 
must be uploaded by July 30th. So keep those dates in mind. July 23rd, you have to get that physical media in, and July 30th for online submissions. Now, locals are um, allowed to submit as long as they are ILCA members. So we have those dates for you. And go to that website, ilcaonline.org, for more information. It's I-L-C-A online.org. Um, lots of people are still commenting. Um, I see Betty H Hutchins is talking to us. <laughs> Good guy, Jim, Betty Hutchins. She shares my namesake with uh, Jim. I met her, uh, Jim Hutchins as well. Um, so thank you to everyone. Um, Beverly Tobin Ford is saying that uh, the, the Wimpasinger Center is a great training center. Um, so we appreciate her saying that. Also want to give a shout out to Brady Knight, local 2515, to Mo El Haiti, who said, hello, Jason, Michigan Apollo supports you. Uh, Rhonda Sue, hey there. Um, 751 has meetings with the vets. Betty Hutchins is saying, Lika Smith, or is it Lika? I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, saying, go Jason. Um, Greg Alexander wants us to point out uh, that Boeing is hiring, so apply for a job join the union that's a good point thank you for bringing that up greg alexander gonzalo hernandez local lodge 2515 jose mill hernandez local lodge 964 strong for west virginia so we are supporting our members out in west virginia in glendale west virginia in our eastern territory so thank you so much for joining us be sure to join us next wednesday at 3 p.m eastern noon pacific for another edition of Activate Live. We leave you now with the song Midnight Railroad Blues by our very own labor music band, Union Nation. See you next time.